All right, so we'll wrap up biology with a nice conversation on siblings. Okay, this one might, again, it's kind, of, it's kind of a trippy thing to look at, so bear with me as I walk you through this graph. This is research from Blanchard and Bogart in 1996, and um, you see in along the, well, let's start with just the bars. So here we have the respondents, the um, people being studied. In the black bar, they self-identify as homosexual. In the white bars, they self-identify as heterosexual. On the x-axis, you see we're looking at whether they have older brothers, older sisters, younger brothers, or younger sisters. And then on the y-axis, we see how many of this type of sibling they have. And it's really pronounced how you see that among the black bars, the homosexual respondents, there are many more older siblings than there are um, younger siblings for the homosexuals. So you see on the left side, um, way more older brothers among the homosexuals than among the heterosexuals. Way more older sisters, twice as many older sisters as there are for the homosexuals than there are among the heterosexuals. And then it flips when you look at the number of si um, younger siblings. So more younger brothers among the heterosexuals than among the homosexuals and slightly more younger sisters among the heterosexuals than among the homosexuals. So what is what are we talking about here? This a lot of people look at this and they go this what are you talking about? Um, this is a, kind of a different way to depict those same bars where you see um, the number of older brothers now is on the um, x-axis and we're only looking at older brothers taking out all the other siblings because you can see on the right pan, right um, graph that older brothers is really way more pronounced for homosexual men than for heterosexuals, right? Um, so, number of older brothers. So you see, if you have no older brothers, you have this um, likelihood of being homosexual that's about 45%. When you get to two older brothers, now we're up to 65%. Oddly, there's that dip at three, but if you get to uh, greater than or equal to four older brothers, you're at like 70% probability of having of being gay yourself. So the more older brothers a, a person has, um, the more, and actually um, all the respondents I forgot to mention in my, when I was discussing the right panel, all the respondents were homosexual men um, in the, oh no, I did mention that. All the black bars were homosexual men. All the white bars were, oh, sorry, I did mention that. Uh, so here's what we have. The more older brothers that a person has, a man has, the more likely that that man is to be homosexual. Why? Why would this be happening? Let me double check what I got here. Okay. Um, a follow-up study, by the way, shows this is not, this doesn't explain female sexual orientation. It only seems to work for men. Why? Okay. Let's take a moment to reflect on pregnancy. When a woman is pregnant, she's got this little alien inside of her body and implanted in her body um, and her body would like to kill it off that's the goal is to kill off this invader because anytime you have an infection or something your body wants to attack it but the, um, the the fetus is encased in its own amniotic sac and floating around in its own little water and so the, it's really um, pretty decently well protected Okay, so we are going to talk a little bit about siblings. Um, okay, so we've talked about twins, uh, and they're a special case of siblings, right, because they shared the womb and maybe even share 100% of genes. Let's talk about just whether you have siblings or not. So here's some research from Blanchard and Bogart from 1996, where they got 302 homosexual men who are represented in the black bars and 302 heterosexual men who are represented in the white bar in the white bars and matched them for all sorts of characteristics age um, other kinds of things right um, so they were basically very similar income education level all those different things they matched them up and then they asked them 
how many older brothers on the x-axis we've got how many older brothers do you have how many older sisters do you have how many younger brothers and how many younger sisters on the y-axis we see how many what the mean number of each type of sibling is um, for each group and what you can see is that for the for the homosexual men there was a significantly higher rate of older brothers among the homosexual men than there was among the heterosexual men there was also you know double the number of older sisters among the homosexual men as there was among the heterosexual men and then you actually see the pattern kind of flip for younger siblings you see that heterosexuals are much more likely to have younger brothers and I don't know if that younger sisters if those two bars are actually significantly different from each other but you do see slightly more younger sisters among heterosexual men so another way to look at that um, from the same study a different version of it is now on the a different version of depicting the da data is showing on the x-axis the number of older brothers that the respondent had and then on the um, y-axis of these what is it 604 total respondents what percentage of them was actually gay so we see when you have zero older brothers only 45 percent of the respondents were gay now remember there's 302 homosexual men 302 heterosexual men so what that means is that um, for those men who had zero older siblings it was slightly more likely that they were heterosexual than homosexual right um, we'll skip over one because it's kind of hard to see exactly what that number is but if you go to two older brothers you see that about 65 percent of the people who reported having two older brothers were gay and if you go to less than or equal to I'm sorry greater than or equal to four older brothers you see about 70 percent of people who had at least four older brothers were gay um, so what you're seeing is that among these respondents it was much more likely for them to report that they were gay if they had two or um, three or four or more older brothers kind of a weird dip there at three so apparently three <laughs> kind of a weird dip but it still is 60 percent of that of those um, respondents were um, homosexual so um, in a follow-up study by the way Bogart did uh, women and did not find any association between women and then how many siblings they had that were older or younger than them so what is going on so first we have to go back and revisit what we learned about pregnancy and how the baby um, implants in mom's uterus right puts that placenta with these little fingers that kind of dig into that nice rich uterus uterine lining that mom has built up and though the baby's the fetus's blood um, supply goes up to mom's blood supply to exchange nutrition oxygen and waste right so baby delivers waste mom del delivers nutrition and oxygen uh, there's a filter that usually keeps them from sharing things like blood or usually toxins are filtered out and things like that so that baby doesn't get exposed to infection and stuff like that um, but the problem is that babies are little invaders they don't carry mom's DNA they carry half of mom's DNA right and then the other half is somebody else's and so mom's body does not recognize the fetus as her own and so uh, mom's body marshals defenses against the pregnancy um, the theory is that with each subsequent pregnancy mom's ability to marshal defenses improves comes on faster comes on earlier so with each subsequent pregnancy you have run a higher and higher risk of damage to the fetus one way or another miscarriage goes up the more babies you've had things like that particularly if mom's been carrying male fetuses because Y chromosome is absolutely foreign to mom's body and so the theory goes that the more pregnancies especially male pregnancies that mom has already carried the more risky it is to the current pregnancy um, especially apparently a male pregnancy so the more older brothers that preceded the current pregnancy the more likely it is that mom's body might do stuff um, that could be stressful to the developing fetus and might interfere with release of testosterone at certain times and things like that so it's possible that that this is why men who have lots of older brothers are more likely to report being gay 
Again, I have to give the disclaimer though. Don't identify your sexual orientation as a function of how many siblings that preceded or followed you. Uh, if you're questioning, I guess this might be information that might be useful to help settle a question, but if you already know your sexual orientation, don't start doubting. Don't start you know, saying, well, I don't have any older siblings. Maybe I am not gay, or maybe I have, wow, I have a lot of older brothers. I must be gay. Um, when I told, when I was showing this to my husband when this first came out, we were, I was in grad school. Actually, I just graduated when this came out. And, you know, we had two kids at that time. We had, um, 1996 was our 10-year anniversary. So we have a lot of evidence that probably we're not gay, probably, since we're married to each other and he's male and I'm female. So probably not. But I shared this with him. He has, my, my husband is the eighth of eight children. Um, four of the children who came before him were male three were female. So I showed him this data and he's all, well, but I have, I have seven older siblings and four of them are <laughs> male. I'm like, I know, right? Um, and he's tried to internalize it the way a lot of times we do when we are um, looking at this kind of correlational data. Uh, the fact that he has older siblings does not make him gay. The fact that a person does not have any older siblings does not make them straight. It's, this is a correlation. Um, so it's kind of interesting. We have an explanation for why these things might be correlated, but this is not causation. And so obviously we don't know why older siblings might be related to um, a higher rate of homosexuality. We're just not sure. Um, we just have the, these different theories. So some other theories. I'm, I have to address the socialization argument because, uh, you know, this comes up a lot. A lot of people who um, are anti-gay will argue on the side of socialization. And I just have to say that, you know, we really don't have a lot of evidence to support any of these socialization interpretations. I'm going to start with a theory called uh, exotic becomes erotic. It was um, advanced by uh, David Bem, who is not related to Sandra Bem, who developed the androgyny scale that we talked about in another chapter. This is a di whole different researcher. Um, his theory, first I'll tell you the theory and then I'll tell you a little bit about them. So this theory says that there are biological variables that lead us to have certain temperaments when we're children, right? And this is, you know, well known that some kids like quiet activities, some kids like more boisterous acti activities, some kids are very reactive to their environment, some are very, um, you know, stable and non-reactive. So those are what we call temperaments. He says biological variables lead to childhood temperaments. So he hasn't said anything really surprising yet. Um, the childhood temperaments lead us to engage in sex typical or sex atypical behavior preferences. So sex typical would be, be behaviors that, you know, a lot of times, uh, you know, socialized socialization favors those behaviors. So boys playing with trucks and girls playing with dolls or boys liking to run, run and make a lot of noise and girls liking to sit still and be quiet and, and those kinds of, you know, sex typical sort of stereotyped behaviors versus atypical behaviors. Girls liking to climb trees and boys liking to play um, quietly or playing with dolls or something. Um, so that's what he's talking about is that our temperaments lead to our behavior preferences. Now, if our behavior preferences are sex atypical, it will make us feel different from our same-sex peers. If our behaviors are sex typical, they'll make us feel different from our opposite sex pair, peers. So a boy who likes to be boisterous and run around and rough and tumble will feel different from girls who he sees sitting still and being quiet and playing imaginary games and things like that a boy who likes to sit still and be quiet and plays the same stuff that the girls like to play will see himself as different from his male peers who like to run and rough and tumble and those kinds of things. And same thing for girls, Bem thought. You know, if you got a girl who likes to rough and tumble, she's going to feel different from the other girls. If you have a girl who likes to be quiet, she's going to see herself as different from the boys. Okay, now here's where it starts to really take an interesting turn in this theory. So now the idea is if you, f you will find yourself physiologically aroused by the people who you feel different from. So if you are feeling different from the opposite sex, you'll find the opposite sex arousing. If you feel yourself as different from your same sex, you'll find your same sex peers arousing. 
And so he says then we develop an erotic attraction to the people who we feel different from and physio physiologically aroused by. So his theory, it's considered a socialization theory because of that component where you're engaging in stereotyped behaviors and the stereotype comes from socialization, right? That's how we learn whether our behavior is sex typical or sex atypical is through what the feedback that we get from other people. You know, boys shouldn't be crying or girls don't climb trees or, you know, we get those kinds of messages. We internalize them. The fact that we like doing this or that combined with the feedback that we get about whether we should like doing this or that comes together to determine who we feel like and who we identify with and who we find arousing. Uh, now there's some researchers who have tried to examine this theory and so this is kind of a weird, this is called a path analysis that you're looking at here and it's one of these weird graphics that psychologists love to draw. They're kind of hard to interpret. Um, but what I wanted to do is first off label everything for you. Um, that first circle A sub G is the role of genes. The C sub G is the role of the shared environment that children experience with their their siblings. So shared environment would be all the stuff that happened inside the household. Shared environment would be um, any shared peers that they have or teams that they were on or other things that they did that were together. I um, mean the non-shared environment would be all the things that the siblings did independently away from each other and that we would say okay that that's not part of the household experience. So EG is the non-shared environment. Um, G is what we call the phenotype. Um, that's your expression of your genes. So you've got your genotype, which is, you know, whether you carry an X or a Y, um, whether you have a gene for blue eyes or, or not, these kinds of things. Your phenotype would be the expression of those genes. And so, uh, for example, you might be carrying a blue eyed gene, but you may, if you also carry a brown eyed gene, you're going to have brown eyes. So your phenotype would be brown eyes, but your genotype would be brown blue, right? So phenotype is the expression of your genes. So if we go up on the chart to um, AG, that would be your genotype. Phenotype is the expression of the genes. Okay, and then we have it flowing into sexual orientation, childhood gender nonconformity, and continuous gender identity, whether you persistently see yourself in a, in a consistent way. Um, you'll notice the correlation coefficients. So genes lead to the genotype. We have a correlation coefficient of um, 0.5. Um, shared environment lead to the phenotype. It really doesn't account for much variability. Your genes and your non-shared environment, non-shared environment being 0.87, those two things count for the bulk of how you express your genes in your phenotype. And a different way of analyzing that produced um, roughly evil, even, I said evil, even amounts of gene and non-shared environment influence on the phenotype. And still the shared environment really doesn't account for anything. Um, if we go down, we see that the phenotype accounts for about um, half of sexual orientation. Um, so we've got sexual orientation um, being influenced by, um, oh, I didn't label those, sorry. Um, we've got genes, we've got shared environment, and um, non-shared environment influencing phenotype. Phenotype accounts for about half of um, sexual orientation, it accounts for about half of your childhood uh, gender nonconformity and it accounts for about half of your gender identity. There are other factors that are below it that are feeding in also separately, but um, knowing that phenotype plays a role in sexual orientation and that phenotype is mostly determined by a combination of your genes and stuff that happens outside your household, that kind of implies that um, that your peers, your friends, your teammates, your teachers, the media, all these different things are, are um, as important roughly as what you were set up with, you know, your biological influences. So if there is an erotic becomes exotic kind of interpretation, it only carries about the same weight as your genes alone would account for. Okay. So that's a pretty complex little theory. How about a less complex theory? We're going to go through Freud's theory in a lot more detail in another chapter. So I'm just going to give you a little, I only want to look at the one that I've highlighted there called the phallic stage. And we'll talk about this in more detail. All I wanted to point out is that Freud thinks that your sexual orientation 
um, gets determined when you're between about the ages of three and six and as you're resolving the challenges of this stage you um, either identify with your same-sex parent or you identify with your opposite sex parent if you end up identifying with your same-sex parent then he says you'll be heterosexual and if you identify with your opposite sex parent you'll end up being he really only talked about men so I'll just say gay um, so for Freud it's about who you see yourself as wanting to be like and who you end up latching on to and who you imitate and what will determine which of your parents you identify with Freud thought if you're a single parent then that's the only person that is there for the child to identify with and it makes it more likely that they'll identify you know if you're a single mom raising a son he said um, that son only has a woman to identify with he's going to identify with his mom and he's going to become gay according to Freud so single moms make gay sons according to Freud um, if you have a really domineering mom who henpecks the dad and the dad's really passive and lets it happen and then Freud says that that will make um, the child want to identify with the mom because you would want to identify with the more powerful parent and so again if you're male if you're a little boy and you have a domineering mom and a passive dad Freud says that'll make the boy gay um, he only really talked about men we could assume balance I guess that theoretically women should also experience the same thing but he didn't really he didn't really say that um, so there's our little Oedipal conflict where you're you know supposed to fall in lust with the opposite sex parent um, you want to kill the same sex parent to get rid of them so you can have the opposite sex parent to yourself you realize that your same sex parent might be really mad and want to castrate you so you repress your lust and aggression in the Oedipal conflict and end up identifying with your same sex parent Freud calls this normal development and abnormal or deviant behavior would be if you don't have this resolution that would happen so if you have let's say a son being raised by either a single mom or a domineering mom with a passive dad then you're going to end up with a homosexual boy according to Freud um, so there we go with my animation I have nothing that I can offer you that would support anything that Freud's saying this was just his theory um, so but this is something that you hear a lot in the pray away the gay kinds of treatment facilities is that they'll pair you the the gay man up with a um, strong confident male uh, mentor who is going to help them to sort of work through their de absent dad or their dad who was too passive issues and then they'll come out the other end straight and oriented towards women um, first off there's no evidence that those treatments work and there's no evidence that that's that has any that anything that they're saying has anything to do with sexual orientation um, so just yeah um, okay let's go ahead and take a little break because I think I've been talking for a while and then we will come and we will finish up this chat this uh, socialization stuff